Right, this is a session that probably quite a few of us have been waiting for, uh, medical and non-medical. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Brian Tregaskis, who is consultant gastroenterologist at Belford Hospital, and he also is our clinical director. Um, he's a man of many, many talents, but he'll be the last to ever tell you about them, so that falls to me to do it. He's also the medical director of the entire Mountain Rescue Committees of Scotland, which I also believe is now called Mountain Rescue Scotland. And um, he would have loved to have been born and lived in the Parisian Medical School in the time of Napoleon. So he is a very, very keen historian. And I think the person I would most like to be is the beneficiary of his large book collection but I'm not in any hurry to acquire that collection. Brian's going to talk about the history of the Belford Hospital. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, and uh, I think the most important thing to remember is that uh, unlike Gerald, well, Gerald Ford, the other Ford, and history is bunk. It isn't bunk. We're informed by history. And it's amazing how we make the same mistakes the second time or the third time round. So in talking about the Belford Hospital's history, we have to bear in mind that it's about the Belford Hospital's future, and what the past can inform us to help us for the future. And I know this is the death slot just before lunch, so it's going to be a short history, and it's going to be to the point. So there we have the Belfort Hospital and its incarnations. At the top, the hospital built in 1865, and opened in 1865, built over 18 months. <coughs> Two sides of it, bigger car park than we've got now, so... <laughs> car parking always being a problem, but no cars to go in it, as you see. And there's the second reincarnation at the bottom, the 1965 Belfort Hospital built and designed by Ramsey Dewar, who told me, when I treated him when he was 85, said the hospital was built to last 25 years, because that was the brief he was given by the health board, that you won't need a hospital in 25 years' time, because everything will be treated at home and people won't be sick. So perhaps Ramsey was a little wrong. So why would you build a hospital in Fort William, this outpost? Hospitals are basically a 19th century invention. Care was given in the home if you could afford it, or not given at all if you couldn't, right up to the Parisian Medical School. I see I got it in, Patrick, of uh, 1795 onwards, where the invention of the hospital occurred. But hospitals didn't really treat people. They observed them. They looked at them and they decided that they were interesting experiments. So we documented them and then we did their post-mortem. And basically from that we learnt all we know about modern medicine. They've evolved because we now have treatments that we can give to the highly technological places they are today. Which is why I think we're probably thinking of moving people out into their homes again. Because I think it's very important that you get that kind of care away from our superbugs and other things and only come to a hospital when you really need it. So hospitals are to assess you and hopefully get you home. We have a widely dispersed rural population with little access to doctors, as they did way down before in 1865. But this place was of great strategic importance. If you take a line through here to Fort Augustus and then on to Inverness, the great fault line of our own Rift Valley. It was a gateway to the Isles. There were lots of marauding Scots to the top, lots of military people down below, and long travelling distances. It's a natural gateway, Fort William. You go left, looking at the map, to go out to the Isles. You go right to go to the rest. And if you want to leave civilization and go south, you go past Glencoe. In 1850, Distressed by the lack of medical care, the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh were asked to do a survey by members of the uh, church here, who basically were the ministers of the manse and therefore the registrars of births, marriages and deaths, and the local wise men who people went to in emergencies for all sorts of help, both spiritual and medical. So the College of Physicians wrote to as many ministers of the manse they actually could, and later on got replies about what was needed. A series of questions that the college asked are available for looking at if anyone's interested. And they were, how many doctors do you practice in this parish? Has the number increased or decreased? For what reasons do they leave? What complaints do the people have in the supply of medical aid? 
all questions that we've asked about 10 times since in different surveys, to which I think we probably know the answers, because history tells you the answer. Is there unnecessary suffering or loss by accident caused by deficiency in medical aid? And I guess the answer to that is sometimes yes, because of pure distance. And to what extent is the deficiency of qualified practitioners made up by the efforts of other parties? So I want to show you the response by the Reverend Dr. Conald, Colin MacDonald of Strontian, and I want you to tell me which one was done in 2015, in the two columns, and which one was done prior to 1865. We have two permanent doctors, if we look at the left side, the number has decreased, that's in both columns. They complain of social and medical isolation. Suffering is caused by the scattered population, and we need some help from medically qualified practitioners and non-medically qualified practitioners and local wise women. So which column is which? And the answer is there are no wise women in Strontian now. <laughs> but they're the same questions and they have similar answers and as we've learned in this symposium so far, the same questions are being asked all over the world. And everybody's got a different solution, but somewhere out there, there's a good solution. Andrew Belford was solicitor of Inverness, born in Brecon in 1798. And he was a factor to a Lockheed Estates. The factor is a peculiarly Scottish version. He is a manager of the estates, but he is also almost the absolute power on the estates. And he can use it to be good or bad. I've used the word parsimonious, which probably means he was uh, pretty good with his money. He was responsible for the clearances of families in favour of sheep. So he's not popular in part of the clearances which infested Scotland at that time. And for parsimonious, I think you can read that he's a right bastard. <laughs> he acquired the Glenfintech estate in 1835 for 221 pounds. And when I was trying to do the cash converter calculation, I came up with only 24,000 pounds. So I would love to buy an estate for 221 pounds equivalent now, in, uh, but I don't think we will. I think the last time it went, it went for a couple of million. So Glenfintig is an estate along Loch Lochie, which is on the Great Strait, on the way up towards Inverness from here, north of Spean Bridge. And uh, basically, he had his Damascus moment, rather like St. Paul. And he ceded the estate by deed of mortification to fund a hospital for the parishes of Kilmally and Kilmonyveig, which are basically the area from north of Spean Bridge, down through here and down towards Ardgar. So quite a long area to actually look after the people. No one else could get in. If you came from Mali, you'd had it, which is about the same now. <laughs> so the deed of mortification was to give his entire estate over to trustees. And amongst the things he said on it, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do it in a second. So the foundation stone was laid in 1863 on ground feud by Cameron of Fassfern and then it got opened on the 22nd of November 1865. The trustees at the time were Cameron of Lochiel, still the big family in this area, the landowner. The sheriff of Fort William called Fraser, and you can see in the display cabinet outside uh, my copy of an 1864 deed, which was Sheriff Fraser's deed, which was the deed of mortification. So that's dated 1864. McLean of Ardgar and the Lord Abinger of Inverlochie Castle. So they were the ones who decided if you could come in or not to the hospital. There were 30 beds, which were reduced by 18, with no loss of efficiency. We did that again. And there was an associated fever hospital in the grounds. That's the original foundation stone, which you can still see at the front of the hospital. It's moved from there, and it's kind of lost the bits at the side. Again, the 1865 building. The wards were at the top. At the bottom, there was the dining area places for people to um, be stored when they died, I suppose you could say. But everyone had to be carried up and down the stairs on a stretcher. So I don't think people know why they put the wards upstairs and everything else downstairs. But um, that was the way. Maybe you got a better view of the bend. The admission criteria were only residents of the parishes of Kilmaly and Kilmanivague. 
and no person in receipt of parochial relief could be admitted because they were under the poor laws that were in extant at the time and actually were receiving some relief and they could therefore pay for it. A um, bit tenuous, I think there was probably still great need. So only those who could not afford to pay and private patients got entry. Those who meet with accident or become afflicted with fevers or other diseases or maladies that require frequent medical attendance. And the wives of poor shepherds. We think the reason the wives of poor shepherds was actually mentioned is that he got his pangs of guilt in his Damascus moment when a shepherdess died when she was confined looking for medical care. So she and the baby died. So he had his moment and he and his wife decided to endow a hospital. So we have to thank him for that. The demands were of the scattered population because of the strategic role of the hospital site. And then as the population grew with the arrival of the West Highland Railway and the railway to Fort Augustus through Glen Fintech, through his own estate, the growth of the aluminium industry and uh, the hydroelectric industry that's actually attached to that, producing massive amounts of cheap electricity in the highlands, and tourism due to the railway and the popular landowning for the nouveau riche of London who came up the way. It was a surgical hospital with visiting specialists. So your visiting specialist would come down Loch Ness on the steamer to Fort Augustus and then get the railway into Fort William, which was not a passenger railway. It was just for uh, trade and other things, but uh, that's how they got here. So no complaining from our colleagues in Inverness now that they come down for a visit, although I'd like to put the steamer back on. That would be good. Some Belford landmarks. The first medical superintendent was John Gray McKendrick. He came with a competitive salary, more than was given to most consultants at that time because they wanted to retain him. So there's a lesson from history as well. If you pay the money, you might get the person. He was later the professor of physiology at the University of Glasgow and wrote as a poet and also wrote many uh, other books including a biography of Helmholtz, the German physiologist who he admired greatly. He was followed by uh, Alexander Cameron Miller who lasted 41 years in the Belford Hospital. He didn't quite die in, uh, in harness but he had a great commitment to the hospital and died in 1927. An x-ray machine was gifted largely because of the large amount of electricity you needed to actually use it, it could actually be used. And it was gifted in 1908, but it wasn't actually started with a scheduled service until some years later, Miller taking the x-ray photographs. It was one of the earliest places to actually have electricity installed. And there's McKendrick looking particularly regal at his Regius chair. Next landmark that we really have to think about is the Dewar Report. So rather like the 1850 report of the Edinburgh College, Dewar was asked to look into the relief of the poor and suffering in the Highlands on the backgrounds of again not having appropriate medical care. It was declared that the service was near close to collapse because of the number of doctors leaving and they left citing poor conditions, medical isolation. We are facing that again in some parts of the Highlands now, in some small hospitals, and they need our support. There was a great need to retain doctors, and Dewar went through a series of um, responses. He went round to every parish in the Highlands, talked to everybody, and uh, basically wrote the report that you can see out in the, um, one of the display boxes, which is one of mine. It was the forerunner, and lots of the things he said, of the Highlands and Islands Medical Service, which a lot of people believe to be the model for the modern NHS, and that the treatment would be free at the point of delivery to those who could afford to pay. It was largely to support general practitioners and district nurses, but the Belfort Hospital, which was collapsing at the time, actually got a large infusion of cash from them, which I think was something like £400, which was a, a large sum of money which enabled the hospital to carry on for a long period of time. In 1928, Dr. Conachy arrived as superintendent and is a GP, and only visiting surgical services then, so the pendulum again swings from one to the other. 
And Mr. Brennan Cran turned up in 1937, but left because he didn't think his salary was sufficient. And he left somewhat under a cloud in 1944, which is good for Scottish Mountain Rescue, because Mr. Donald Duff arrived in 1944 and was really the basic founder of effective Scottish Mountain Rescue and certainly medical care on the hill. Dr. Conachie and Miss MacArthur. Right, so it's not Patrick's six fingers, but he has five fingers, one of which is a capstan full strength, with no filter, of which he actually smoked 60 a day. And uh, there is no picture extant of Conachie that doesn't have a capstan full strength. Miss MacArthur is our link there from this picture in 1968 with the 18th century, because she was here as a young nurse in the area of 1890, and there she was still going strong in 1968. So she's our link with that long Belford pass, as are these redoubtable ladies. I was hoping that a lady on left, Sister Fraser, might be here, but I don't know if she is, because she would certainly correct me, because I haven't got these names right. And being a proper matron of the Belfort Hospital, she would make sure that I wouldn't leave here without getting them right. So there they all are. That's our link of matrons right up to 1968. And I'm pleased to say that Morag Fraser is still alive. Belfort landmarks. Duff came to replace Cran. Great. And then the National Health Service came into existence in 1948. There's the classical picture of Donald Duff down on Sheepfank Wall in Glen Nevis. The stretcher you see there uh, is widely known as the Duff stretcher, but it doesn't describe it. It was the most effective piece of mountain rescue kit ever invented, and he got it, ideas for it out of things he'd seen in the First World War where he served. It's done a great job. It's got the skids on the bottom to come down hills in the winter and uh, it's really pretty mobile. And every mountain rescue stretcher since to Hamish McInnes's from Glencoe, which we still use today, are designed basically on the Duff stretcher. So he made a big effect on us all. In 1959, Mr. Ian Campbell came to be superintendent. And in 1965, after much discussion and prevarication, we moved to a new site which was made available by the closing of the convent of the Sisters of Notre Dame. And our first pre-registration house officer was appointed. And I think the gentleman might be coming tomorrow. Yeah, is that right, Patrick? Yeah. In 1982, we decided for the first time we needed physicians. And uh, along came Dr. Gavin Brown, my old colleague, who's sadly not with us anymore. And I came in 1992 as the second one for the luxury of a one in two. All right, where's the capstan full strength? It's pointing directly at you, because uh, there is no picture in existence. Mr. Campbell on the left and Sister Fraser with a happy brood in the middle there. And there we are, the 1965 reincarnation. So what do we learn from history? Adapt or perish, now as ever, is nature's inexorable imperative, H.G. Wells. I think he's right. You can't have a service that's going to be the same all the time. You can't look back without actually getting those messages and looking forward. So if we're going to keep what we believe to be very necessary rural services delivered properly to patients in these areas, we have to adapt. Boerhaver, famous Dutchman, lectured five hours a day. His hospital had only 12 beds. But by Sydenham's method, Sydenham the great English Hippocrates, he made of it the medical centre of Europe. He basically founded the Edinburgh Medical School, because everyone went over to Leiden to learn from him, and then went back to Edinburgh. He had a great effect on the Parisian Medical School. And if you hadn't been to Leiden in those days, you were no one. I like to think you've got to come to the Belford. What red lines must we have when we design things? for the future. Whatever the greater practitioner, he must be able to deliver the service to the same standard as in the bigger units. It can't be, well, that's all right for the Highlands. It doesn't really matter because no one gets ill there. It's got to be to the same standard. Maybe delivered differently, maybe delivered in different forms, may have different integrative pathways, 
but it's got to be to the same standard or we all better go home. It is for politicians, as someone said earlier, to determine what the level of service is, but it's for us to determine what politicians think and what politicians do. And if we don't do that and we don't agitate, then we probably get what we deserve. And doctors must deliver those services to the highest standards or reformat it. And it must be reformatted so that it works for the people we serve, because they deserve the best health care. What innovations? We've heard of some this morning. We have a combined assessment to ensure the knowledge of all of our generalists is there. Everyone's welcome. General practitioners are welcome, but the needs of the service often means they can't come along. But we need them for the wisdom and knowing about the families. We've got a general practitioner who's an accredited general physician. It can be done. We've done it. We didn't ask permission. We did it. We have an investment going on now in hospital at home for a rural community, not to, um, to actually have different level of service, but for having the same level of service wherever you are in our rural area. So if we can do, if we can do that by appointing full and part-time geriatricians who can go out into people's homes and deliver that service and prevent admission, then that's going to be good for the future as you've seen our population is ageing and growing. We need a quality of access for everyone, no matter where they live, within this patch or elsewhere. And uh, that investment has been taken on by Highland Health Board, to whom I am eternally grateful. They went into the dark with me and they gave plenty of money to appoint extra people. And, um, you know, they're probably still counting that at home, but they believed, and I think that's important for the future. We don't fight with our managers, we work with them for the benefit of the patient, who is our reason for existing. Health Innovations 2, we have links with major centres outside of Inverness as well to ensure adequate workload in non-emergency work to maintain skills. There's two reasons for that. It benefits the major centre, which has got capacity but not personnel, and it benefits the small hospital, which has the personnel, but sometimes without adequate workload. And that can't be done by just a DGH the size of Inverness, we have links with Edinburgh for surgery and anaesthetics. We want links with other people, so if anyone wants a link, come and talk, because it's important for our people to go and get enough cases and to be the peers they actually are, to fight that discrimination that they have, you're only the guy who works at the Belford, and actually that's the wrong way round. We should all be of exactly the same standard, and by working in a major centre, then you prove that to the whole world. Not that it really needs to be proven, but some folk think it does. Rotational weekend appointments to ensure continuity of care and downtime for the incumbents are also important to avoid early burnout through the workload. And I think that is important, and Duncan fulfills that role perfectly for us here, and we'd hope to have further rotational appointments in different specialities in the future. And as you know, it's always sunny here in the Highlands, so we're always positive about things. And even in the depths of winter, it's always sunny in the Highlands. So, a very short spin through the history of the Belfast Hospital. Thank, thanks very much, Brian. Uh, I must confess, I've had it heard said in the halls of Edinburgh that the physicians there have yet to meet someone who knows more about medicine and the human body than this gentleman here. I think we can add history to that interest as well. Brian, thank you very much. As it's a keynote, we won't take questions, but he will be available during lunchtime, or if he isn't, he, uh, if he hadn't realised it, he will be now. He'll be available at lunchtime if any of you want to approach him or indeed see the exhibits. Once again, on behalf of the audience in the Belfort, Brian, thank you so much. Thank you.